to The Lincoln Project. I'm your host, Reed Galen. Today, I'm excited to welcome back to the show Ruth ben author and professor of history and Italian at New York University. Ruth is an expert on fascism, authoritarianism, war, propaganda, and unfortunately, Donald Trump, and is the recipient of the Guggenheim, Fulbright, and other fellowships. She's a columnist for MSNBC, has written for a wide variety of outlets, including CNN, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post, and has authored multiple books, her latest being Strongmen from Mussolini to the Present. And everybody, if you have not read Strongmen, get it today. She is the founder and publisher of Lucid, her Substack newsletter. Today, she's coming to us from New York City. Ruth, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to speak with you. All right. So Ruth, when we have you on, there's there's literally any there's like 800 different things we could talk about. So let's let's start uh, with what we were talking about just before uh, we went on the air, which is uh, as of this recording, we're recording on Monday. Um, oh, you know, late last week, um, E. Jean Carroll, uh, a writer who uh, Donald Trump was was adjudicated to have sexually assaulted, was awarded eighty three million dollars uh, in, a, in her defamation case against Trump, he immediately becomes the victim of this. Um, he has been the victim all along of this. Um, Elise Stefanik said she wasn't at all worried about it. Other female Republicans have said they thought it was a hoax. Uh, as you noted right before uh, we started recording that match slap in all uh, with with, uh, you know, full transparency, a guy I have known since the 2000 Bush campaign, if you can believe such a thing, uh, said, you know, first it'll be Trump and then they're, you know, we'll all have to walk the gangplank. I think Ruth is what he said. So take us into the psychology of this. Is it just more victimization or is it victimization uh, mixed with uh, the ability to abuse whoever you want, whenever you want, with no repercussions? Well, that's the dream is to be able to commit all kinds of crimes with impunity, including uh, sexual crimes. And there's a whole through line. It was, this was one of the worst uh, parts for me to write as a woman uh, in Strongman, uh, my machismo chapter, you know, Mussolini was uh, a serial rapist and, and as was Gaddafi, who also kept people prisoner. Um, and it's as though uh, when we get to authoritarians, it, it, at its worst, it can be like Jeffrey Epstein becoming the head of state. And they use the instruments of uh, the state, like secret police, to scout women, to, you know, sometimes to kidnap them, to, and then to pay them off or, or survey them, uh, pay for abortions, all of that. So, so, and in the case of um, 21st century uh, people like Donald Trump and Silvio Berlusconi, these these men have this mania of controlling as many women and having as many women as possible. So it's very interesting. So they go into business uh, in areas that allow them to have what I call a pipeline of bodies. So you have access. Uh, so what did Trump do? He had Trump models. Um, he had uh, Miss Universe. Uh, and, and also he was on TV. Berlusconi actually owned all the private TV networks in Italy. So he had a pipeline of people who wanted to be on TV. And then he had sex parties that, that he boasted about. And ultimately, in Berlusconi's case, having an uh, underage woman at one of those sex parties uh, it was one of the things that did him in, <laughs> meaning he had to resign and he was convicted in 2013. <clears throat> so the... the they, this arrogance that you described, the feeling that they should be able to do whatever they want to female bodies is part of the mentality. And I was uh, very interested in a negative way that Donald Trump partly de decriminalized domestic violence while he was president. This, this kind of ran under the radar with all the other things he did, but he changed the, the laws so that um, economic and stalking and any other kind of harassment uh, did not count as domestic violence anymore. So he made it easier for women to be controlled. So a couple of things. One is remember, gosh, is it almost three years ago now? Um, two and a half years ago, Ruth, when when the FBI searched Mar-a-Lago for the missing, you know, top secret and beyond documents. I remember the whole thing was if they can do it to him, they can do it to you, which I think still continues today and is echoed in what Schlapp said as well. And it's the idea of, yes, if you steal top secret documents from the government, 
Yes, the FBI very well will come to visit you. If you sexually assault women, yes, or men in the case of allegedly matched lap, then yes, either a civil or a criminal proceeding will probably be following you around. And this this is why it's I, I sort of don't understand why the things they're saying are like, yeah, if you do those things, you're going to be in trouble. And this is somehow their argument, Ruth. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, it makes sense to them because um, what they fear is being brought to justice. And these are people who have had power, have been able to arrange systems, uh, whether they're paying off people, whatever they're doing, to escape prosecution. And they feel that this is their right. And it's hard for uh, law-abiding people to, to get into the heads of um, people like Donald Trump and Matt Schlapp and all those other abusers. And part of what um, pe- authoritarians do is they send a message by appointing other abusers to high positions of power. And so Donald Trump's cabinet, you know, contained a, a, a high number of Steve Bannon and others who had either been um, accused of or charged with domestic violence or who were known to be bullies because this is part of corruption, too. You want to set an environment in your White House, in your administration, that's conducive to bullying people, to harassing them in all kinds of ways, and to, to ultimately to also committing crimes. And, and so the more people you have who are corrupt and abusive and arrogant in your government, the, the faster uh, you will have this contagion uh, of, of prof- you know, the end of professional ethics and all of that. So it, this actually connects to wider things about the destruction of the rule of law, the end of professional ethics, um, and all the things that authoritarians see as a kind of the enemy. Well, and, and going back through, you, you know, your book, Strongmen, and all through, also through history, is the, these sorts of movements and these types of people find one another because, correct me if I'm wrong, so many otherwise normal administrations, let's say the Biden administration, are really, I mean, you can, they're a rogues gallery over the course of the, the country, but only Donald Trump's administration would allow people like this to rise to any sort of levels of power. Right. Like otherwise, these people would be like, no, you're not you're not even allowed in as a guest, let alone to the National Security Council. Yes. And and, you know, any administration can have bad eggs and then you have compliance systems. You have mechanisms of all federal agencies to to get rid of people and who who, you know, to violate your your ethical codes. But um, what authoritarians do is that they destroy those mechanisms. Um, or they offer pardons. So Donald Trump is one of many authoritarians to offer pardons to people who have broken the law. And that sends a message to future members of his next administration, if he gets there, that any kind of corruption will be not just tolerated, but rewarded. Because basically, authoritarianism is, is the criminalization of government. It's, 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 it depends on lying, on corruption, on repression, on crime, actually. Uh, and some of the states that Donald Trump is now praising the leaders, you know, Kim Jong-un and, and Putin, these are criminal entities. Like, Russia is a kleptocracy. North Korea, most of its foreign currency is earned by cybercrime. It's a criminal entity. And so you have to have lawless people uh, in the government and in place and you have to set a whole um, atmosphere of rewarding crime. And this was one of the most depressing things I learned uh, through my survey of 100 years of how this has unfolded in different times and places, because it's kind of the same mechanism everywhere. Um, you know, the Nazis actually used to recruit people in prisons because they needed uh, criminals to be, you know, in their uh, labor service or all of their different bureaucracies, and ultimately, of course, as torturers and all kinds of unsavory things, criminals uh, were the best suited. So they recruited in prisons, which kind of says it all. Let me ask a question. It's a little bit off, off, off. T- it's not off topic, but I, you brought up something I want to. Uh, I was thinking about over the weekend. So my wife and I watched the holdovers. 
uh, with Paul Giamatti, and he's this sort of grumpy old professor at a, at a New England boys boarding school in, I think, the late 60s, early 70s. And he takes one of the students because they've been held over for Christmas break. The guy can't go home. And they're at a museum in Boston, and he's an antiqui- and, and, and Giamatti's character is an antiquities professor, right, a history professor, loves the classics. And he says, Mr. Tully, there's nothing new in human existence. There's nothing in this realm, in that realm, in this realm, in that realm. And it reminded me, Ruth, that there really isn't. So why is it always such a surprise when it pops up again? Good question. Um, And indeed, there are these patterns and cycles. And well, one thing is that it looks different every time and place. And so people are not prepared. Um, And, you know, today, um, we have fewer one party states outside of communism. So fascism looks a bit different today in terms of, you know, we're not going to have a one party state as easily. Um, other things, though, are exactly the same. The personality cult rules are the same. Corruption mechanisms are the same, as you're saying. But people also are always in denial. They think that it's not going to happen to them or to their country. And so in Germany, which was one of, it's worth remembering, it was one of the most advanced countries in the world in not, Nazi, before Nazism, in science, technology, uh, engineering, graphic design, like groundbreaking cultural Art, things. Art, culture, music. Everything. So right. they saw this like, you know, lunatic ranting and they didn't take him seriously. And Mussolini was dismissed even after he was dictator as a buffoon who was going to go away. And so, uh, and even when there's a coup, this is like, in a way, the most shocking example um, that I studied so in Chile, there was a coup. And so, you you know, you leave home and you're in a democracy and you come back if you come back at all and you're in a dictatorship. But the conservative Christian Democrats, who are the conservative enablers uh, in this case, they uh, they supported the coup at first because they didn't like the left. And they actually thought the leadership actually thought that Pinochet was going to restore order in Chile and then give power back to them. Which, of course, wasn't going to happen. So the oligarchs thought, we'll be in charge. We can control him. Just like just like they did with, with Hitler, right? Hindenburg was like, he's a buffoon. We can control him. Uh, what's his name? Von Poppen. We can control him, right? He'll sit in the corner. He'll be told what to do. And then voila, again, Ruth, nothing new in human history. It never works out that way. Yeah, and so, so you have deep mechanisms of... And the the reason there's so much continuity is we're dealing with the realm of human psychology, right, of of denial, of just uh, despair. Also, you know, denial because um, you overestimate your own culture's, you know, um, ability to withstand something because maybe you overestimate human nature. You think, well, people can't be that corrupt. Um, But also some people are in denial because... If they admit there's a huge problem, which would have been nice if people uh, did that after uh, Trump's I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone speech, you know, many years ago now, it means maybe they have to do something about it. And many people don't want to get involved or they don't know how and they want everything to continue. And so they stick their heads in the sand. Right. And they become bystanders instead of upstanders. That's right. And it's particularly a problem in our country versus, for example, a place like Brazil, where you had January 8th, you know, instead of January 6th, and the government acted very quickly to, to, pers- you know, to, to prosecute um, those who uh, were try- you know, having the insurrection on behalf of Bolsonaro because they had a coup and they had an over 20-year military dictatorship. So in countries that had a dictatorship, they have learned how quickly things can change. Whereas America, we had a form of authoritarianism in the Jim Crow South, but we did not have a national experience of dictatorship. So people have the idea it can't happen here. Well, and then you've seen recently, just in the past day or week, days and weeks, uh, in Germany, mass protests against the AFD, the, the far right party. And in fact, I believe... Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ruth, there were some local elections where the AFD got blown out. That's right. Um, and they were they had been doing quite well. 
And um, the Germans know exactly how dangerous this is and are very smart in having these mass demonstrations now um, because timing is important with nonviolent protest. Um, And there were millions of people who came out because, and the reason it's important is that there are many people who are sitting home thinking, as we were saying, it's either not a big deal, it's not that serious, the liberal press is overreacting, or they don't want to get involved, or they're afraid. But when so many people come out to protest, it leads other people to come out. And the more the numbers are seen in the media uh, is forced to have a narrative about this happening, and this is the national mood, fewer people will vote for the far right because they think that there's nothing going to stop them.